right, let's talk about something important for all of us in healthcare. We're seeing a Guillain-Barre syndrome outbreak happening right now in Pune, India. Yeah, it's a really concerning situation. Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, it's an autoimmune disorder. Uh. That's right. Basically, the body's immune system starts attacking its own nerve cells. Oh, wow. So that's what leads to the muscle weakness and even paralysis we see with GBS. Exactly. And unfortunately, the situation in Pune is pretty serious right now. Yeah, the numbers are really concerning. Uh, 160 reported cases just since January. And there have been five suspected deaths from GBS, which is, you know, always a tragedy. Absolutely. And on top of that, there are 48 patients who are currently in intensive care. And of those, 21 are actually on ventilators. So it's a very serious situation. So can you walk us through how this typically progresses? What are the initial symptoms like? Sure. So usually it starts with this tingling and numbness, particularly in the hands and feet. I see. So those are the early warning signs. Yeah. And then after that, you start to see muscle weakness developing and it becomes more and more difficult to move your joints. And how long does this progression usually take? Well, the symptoms tend to worsen over a period of about two to four weeks. And I know the mortality rate can vary, but what's the general range we're looking at? Yeah, for GBS, it's usually somewhere between 3% and 13%. So quite a range there. Yeah, it really depends on the severity of the case and, of course, the quality of healthcare support available. Now, this outbreak in Poon, the primary cause seems to be Campylobacter jejuni, right? That's right. It's a pretty common cause of foodborne illness. There was a study in India that looked at this connection a bit more closely, right? Yeah, there was a study between 2014 and 2019 that followed 150 GBS patients. Okay, what did they find? Well, they found that 79% of those patients actually showed signs of a previous infection. Hmm, interesting. And specifically, 33% tested positive for Campylobacter. So a significant portion had that prior exposure. Yeah, and what's even more interesting is that 65% of the patients in that study had co-infections. Co-infections, meaning that they had multiple infections going on at the same time. Exactly. So, you know, it's not always a simple one-to-one -one relationship between a specific bacteria or virus and GBS. Now, I know there was also a GBS outbreak in Peru, right? Yes. There were over 200 suspected cases in just the first seven months of 2023. Wow. And that's when they declared a national health emergency, right? Yeah. They had to ramp up public health measures significantly. And how did the situation in Peru compare to the outbreak in India? Well, in Peru, about two-thirds of those cases were linked to Campylobacter. So a similar culprit in a different part of the world. It is interesting, though, isn't it, how countries with generally good hygiene practices tend to have fewer GBS cases that are specifically linked to Campylobacter. Right. So it seems like those public health measures can have a real impact. Absolutely. And in those countries, respiratory infections actually become a more significant factor in GBS cases. Now, I know we've been focusing on Campylobacter, but are there other things that can trigger GBS? Yeah, there are. Back in 2015, there were a number of GBS cases in Brazil that were linked to the Zika virus. Oh, right. Doing that big Zika outbreak. Exactly. And more recently, in 2021, there were a few hundred GBS cases in the United Kingdom that were potentially linked to a COVID-19 vaccine. So a variety of potential triggers there. It is important to note, though, that just being exposed to Campylobacter doesn't automatically mean you're going to develop GBS. So there's more to the story. Right. It's not quite that simple. What have researchers found about the specific kind of Campylobacter that's usually involved? Well, they found that it's usually a very specific strain that has this unique outer layer it's coated in these sugar molecules. And this coating is what causes the problems. Yeah, it's all about the molecular structure of that sugar coating. It can actually resemble the coating of human nerve cells. Oh, wow. So the immune system gets confused. Exactly. It attacks the bacteria, which is what it's supposed to do. But sometimes it mistakenly attacks the nerves, too. And that's what leads to the damage we see in GBS. Right. It's this phenomenon called molecular mimicry. It's really quite fascinating. It, it is. It's incredible how these tiny molecular differences can have such huge consequences. Absolutely. And what makes this even more interesting is that only a small percentage of Campylobacter strains actually have this nerve-like coating. So it's a bit of a rare occurrence. It is. And that's why we don't see GBS developing after every Campylobacter infection. Molecular mimicry. That's a fascinating concept. Our immune system is usually so good at recognizing what belongs in the body and what doesn't. 
How does this strain of Campylobacter manage to fool it so effectively? Well, you see the sugar coating on this particular strain, it's incredibly similar to the molecules you find on the surface of our nerve cells. So the immune system, it basically gets tricked. It sees these bacterial cells and it thinks, hey, these are part of us, and then it launches an attack, but unfortunately that attack ends up targeting the nerve cells too. So that's what causes the damage we see in GBS. Yeah. It's almost like it has to be this perfect storm for this to happen. Yeah. It does seem that way. Only a tiny fraction of Campylobacter strains have this specific type of sugar coating. I mean, most of the time, Campylobacter infections, they're pretty uncomplicated. You know, some diarrhea, maybe some cramping, and it clears up on its own. But in mm. these rare cases, well, the consequences can be much more severe. Well, this has been a really insightful discussion. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And to all our listeners out there, thanks for joining us for this deep dive into Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, let's review some of the basics of Guillain-Barre syndrome. The 5A of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy. Guillain-Barre syndrome represents a critical autoimmune disorder characterized by a rapid inflammatory process targeting peripheral nerves. Healthcare providers must recognize this condition's primary mechanism of myelin sheath destruction. The syndrome impacts multiple nerve roots disrupting critical nerve signal transmission. Epidemiological data reveals a consistent incidence of one to two cases per 100,000 individuals annually, underscoring its clinical significance. Ascending paralysis. The hallmark of this syndrome is its distinctive ascending paralysis pattern. Clinicians will observe weakness that systematically progresses from lower extremities upward potentially involving arms and torso. The rapidity of progression demands immediate clinical attention. In severe scenarios, respiratory muscles can become compromised, potentially necessitating mechanical ventilation. This ascending pattern makes early recognition paramount for implementing timely interventional strategies. Autonomic dysfunction Guillain-Barre syndrome extends beyond motor nerve involvement, critically affecting the autonomic nervous system. Patients may present with complex physiological disruptions, including unpredictable blood pressure fluctuations and cardiac rhythm abnormalities. These autonomic disturbances complicate clinical management and require comprehensive monitoring during hospitalization. Healthcare providers must remain vigilant for these systemic manifestations. Albuminocytologic dissociation. A distinctive diagnostic feature of this syndrome is albuminocytologic dissociation in cerebrospinal fluid analysis. This specific finding demonstrates elevated protein levels concurrent with a normal white blood cell count. Lumbar puncture becomes an essential diagnostic procedure, enabling clinicians to differentiate Guillain-Barre syndrome from other neurological conditions. This marker provides crucial diagnostic clarity. Aeroflexia. Approximately 90% of Guillain-Barre syndrome patients exhibit diminished or absent deep tendon reflexes. This aeroflexia serves as a significant clinical indicator of peripheral nerve involvement. During patient evaluation, the absence of reflexes becomes a critical diagnostic signal, helping healthcare providers confirm the syndrome's presence and assess its neurological impact. Take home message. Understanding these five key aspects provides healthcare providers with a comprehensive framework for managing Guillain-Barre syndrome. Early recognition, systematic assessment, and prompt intervention remain crucial for optimizing patient outcomes in this potentially life-threatening condition. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comment section.